exactly. I haven't even checked how many are actually have le um, have looked at the video with uh, cable, but it's not. I watched have the it. Option. I watched it. You watched it. Good. There were the, when I checked, there were some twenty-five or so views. Yeah. But it's there for well, maybe not eternity, but uh, for some time to come. No, Pauline is there. Hi. Max, are you going to cut to me first and then to the PowerPoint or straight to the PowerPoint? Um, right. Uh, your video has not started. Do you want to show yourself or just... Yeah, I've done it now. Sorry. Okay. I suggest uh, we do it uh, like we did last time. I do a very short uh, technical opening, uh, pass over to Robert, and who will introduce both of you. Pauline right. and Alison, and then, um, yeah, over to first Alison and then Pauline. Pauline? Hi. Oh, you're okay. We can hear you very well. Good. Okay. okay. Morning, so Pauline. <laughs> Good morning, Alison. <laughs> okay. Alison, I still don't have your video. Oh, because it, yeah, you have to press the button twice, that's why. Ah, Sorry. okay, there you are, good, okay. And then I can lock a video spotlight. I'm learning myself. It's quite complex, isn't it? I yes, think it, it is. I think it's great when we know how to do it, but... Yes, and it is complex, that is true. So Robert is now in the spotlight, as he yep. will be the next to take over after me. Robert? Um, yes? Hi, good morning. That light behind you is very bright. I know, but then I uh, switch it off, then uh, there is no light at all. Or I right. Can, I can do it. <laughs> but is this... Uh, oh, okay, no, this is, this is all right. That's better. Yeah, Screen's better. brightness. Yeah. Yeah, it is, uh, it is, my, 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 uh, my light uh, is after, uh, behind the screen, and uh, yeah. it's, so it's indirect. You were looking a bit ghoulish. <laughs> Goo ghoulish? What is that? <laughs> like a ghost. Like a ghost, yeah. Wow. <laughs> is that me? <laughs> no, not really. Okay. I guess we can start as we are recording it anyway. So welcome everybody who's joining live or who's seeing us this uh, later on uh, as part of the virtual conference on OER and TVET. Um, a technical remark, please use the messaging function of this application for feedback, for any questions you have, and also for the discussion. Um, there's a little um, speech um, symbol at the lower left hand, and if you click on that, you'll see uh, a column at the left with those functions, nice. allowing you to, to use the chat function. Um, yeah, so with that, I'll, I'd like to pass over to Robert Skuba, our uh, moderator, uh, who will introduce the presenters for today. Yes, thank you, Max. This is uh, indeed in the virtual conference, which started last week, Friday. Uh, the fourth topic already, the fourth of the five topics which will be part of this uh, virtual conference. And in this topic, we are um, uh, hearing and learning from good practices. So I'm very glad that we have two uh, experienced uh, people who want to uh, join their experiences, uh, who want to uh, share their experiences with us, and who have joined us to give uh, short presentations. Well, the first I want to introduce is Alison Mead Richardson. She is an educated, uh, educated master, uh, a master's degree in education in the University of London and did a doctorate at the UNISA University. And she is currently the education specialist for TVET at the Commonwealth of Learning. She lived and worked in Africa for 13 years and she is currently managing projects for technical and vocational skills development. And that's I guess where her practices and her le uh, lessons learned come from. So, Alison, please, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Robert. 
Hello everybody, nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, what I'm going to do as per Max's request and Robert's request is just to run through um, a little bit about the work that we've been doing in um, OER in TVET across the Commonwealth um, and try to pull out at the end some of the lessons that we've learned um, and talk about some of the challenges that, that we and our partners have, have encountered. Um, we have some answers, we certainly don't have all of them. So let me uh, go into sharing there. You can see my presentation. So let me get moving. Um, so for those who don't know, I know many of the people in this uh, network do know Commonwealth of Learning because we have uh, shared partners, but we're a government uh, intergovernmental in um, agency involved in education for development. And our mandate is to support both institutions and governments um, to improve what we call the scope, the scale and the quality of education. And we do that through uh, the use of appropriate technology. And historically, COL was known as a distance learning organization, but you can see there in my little jigsaw quadrant, um, now we're talking about the application of OERs both for contact learning, also for distance learning, but increasingly online learning and what we call in Tibet flexible and blended learning. Um, Cole comes from a viewpoint that learning should be available for everyone and it should be open. And of course, open education resources help us to, to reach that goal uh, by working with our partners. Oh, sorry, missed the button. There we go. So what are we doing then? Um, OER in TVET is fundamentally aimed at improving quality. That's where we believe there is huge potential for the use of OER um, in, in TVET. So the way we work is to identify partners who've got these strategic objectives to improve quality. And we're also, of course, looking at increasing access. We, look, we work with them to identify the process of change that is needed, because I think anybody who's, who's ever approached this will realize there is a change process involved. And of course, another major element is in capacity building. Um, and there are some of the areas that we work with partners to build capacity. So uh, management, the use of technology, um, how to identify relevant OER, how to evaluate them, and then how to adapt and contextualize them. And the building of capacity isn't just about the, um, the OERs, but it's in, again, there's another jigsaw. We see it in four areas. Um, the things that have to change include the policy and the strategy, the organizational structures, ICT infrastructure management, and also, of course, the big piece, which is teaching and learning. Just quickly to give you some idea of the kinds of things we've been doing, as Robert mentioned, I work with partners all over the Commonwealth. We work in four regions, and I'll just give you a quick regional snapshot. So in the Pacific, um, OERs is, is very prevalent in the Pacific, um, which is very interesting, because if you read any of the global documents, you don't hear much about this. But there's a lot going on, as you can see. I'm not going to go through them all. You can read them for, for yourselves. Um, but what's interesting in the Pacific is um, that we can develop a program with one country and often it gets picked up by another and adapted and contextualized and used somewhere else. And of course, that's one of the big values of, of, of OER. In Asia, um, we work with both the State Resource Center and um, this is an NGO uh, in, in Bangladesh. And through um, the development of multimedia OER, print-based and also um, video, we've been able to impact on more than 5,000 people in terms of giving them livelihood skills. And we've done the tracer studies and research to show what's happening. Moving on to Africa. Um, Africa is probably where the majority of my, my work and focus is. Um, we have this partnership, which many of you listening are, are members of, called Invest Africa. Um, there are more than 90 partners, inst partner institutions, and these range from um, TVET technical training institutes right up to polytechnics and universities of science and technology. Um, we work in the, the seven countries that you can see listed there. 
And there also is a list of some of the courses that have been developed. And there's a lot more being developed. We, you know, Cole doesn't get highly involved in all the course development. Um, many of our partners buy into this approach, and they just start to develop their own OER content. One of the things I would say in this region that we haven't done as well as we would like to, and that's the sharing between countries, or even within countries, and, and we're still working on that. The other interesting thing to, um, to note is that institutional policy development be, uh, becomes increasingly important. We don't recommend starting with policy because we believe that practice should inform policy. Um, but at some point, it, it becomes necessary in certain contexts, not all, that um, we support the institutions to develop their own um, institutional policy on open education or open education resources or both. Um, and linked to that, of course, is national policy development. We're working um, in the countries you can see there, Kenya, Zambia, Nigeria. Um, some of those countries have already got their own TVET ODL policies um, with our support. Others are still working on them, and OER is always encompassed within that. And lastly, Caribbean. I'll not talk a great deal about this because Pauline's going to share in a moment. Um, but again, two or three countries are, are re recognizing that um, using OER, sharing OER is a way to be more efficient. And I think that's really exciting because if you get it right, then OER can help to make you more efficient. And, and that's, uh, that's something that we're, we're trying to support and trying to learn more about. Okay, I'll move on. The last thing I want to tell you about is Virtual University for Small States of the Commonwealth. This is not my initiative, but it, it's, it's managed by a colleague. This is a collaboration of institutions of the 32 small states in the Commonwealth. Again, you can see a list there. They're producing, sharing, adapting OER, and they, they produce full course programs. So they, you know, you can see at the top there, they've done a Master of Education Leadership. Now, these are shared within the members of BUSC. Um, but they, they're, they're OER, they're available through Cole's website, and I'll post the link in a moment, um, and anyone can get access to these. Okay, so moving on then, lessons learned. Um, I think the first question I thought about was, well, who's involved in this? And I think it's important to realize, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not, <clears throat> it's not just about what teachers do. Um, if OER are going to be successfully integrated, ultimately, not perhaps not to start with, but ultimately there's going to be, um, you know, whole institution uh, approach needs to change. Capacity building I've already mentioned, and obviously it's critical. OER is increasingly about ICT skills, so um, we don't do ICT training, but teachers need that basic level before they can, can really fly with, with OER. Obviously, people need to know about open licenses and creative commons, and we had that great um, presentation from Cable last week. And skills really are in those three areas, how to identify relevant, appropriate OERs, how to evaluate them against your own curriculum, your own needs, your own learner profile, and how to adapt them so that they meet those needs. Those are the skills that teachers need to build. Um, in terms of the policy and strategy, as I said right at the very beginning, our use of OER is, is really aimed and focused on quality improvement. Um, and when you start down this road of, of integrating OER into your programming, it does often require a review of existing policies such as plagiarism and acceptable use and, and that kind of thing. So those are some of the lessons that, that we've learned. Some of the challenges that, um, that we face, and I would state here that in my view and in the way that we're working with people, um, OER is very much linked to online and resource-based learning, so what we call flexible and blended. So some of the challenges that our partners talk to us about that they are facing, um, overall resistance to change, well, yes, you get that when um, 
when you bring in any kind of educational change, it's something that has to be dealt with, has to be managed, has to be, um, has to be consultation and collaboration about that. Um, there is a culture in some countries of monetizing learners' uh, materials. Um, we've been talking about that on the uh, online conference. Um, one of the big challenges is trying to help people to get an understanding of the shared benefits. Um, people can very quickly see the benefit of being a consumer of OER, but not necessarily becoming a producer. Um, and I think that that's something that we, we have to work on. There's also something to do with the, the, what I call the not invented here syndrome. Um, you know, sometimes people, academics in particular, but, um, you know, people think, well, it's not good enough because we didn't write it. So that's a, a barrier that has to be overcome. Um, a constant refrain we hear from our partners is, we don't have time to do this. Um, we understand that people have full teaching loads, um, but we see this as, as an investment in, um, in quality, an investment in the future. Yes, it takes time to develop good quality education resources, but you do reap the benefits of them. Um, and of course, there's the potentials for uh, economies of scale. Um, all of this, you know, online learning, resource-based learning, development of OERs, requires new roles within the institutions, roles and, and um, job functions that don't necessarily exist. So you need new skills in graphics and layout, instructional design. You might need online content development. That requires additional technical support. Um, you know, there's a whole host of things that may be needed, video production, media production. Um, and so often teachers start to develop those skills themselves, which is fantastic, but again, more time. Um, but also, ultimately, institutions need to look at providing support for those areas. Funding, of course, is, a, is an issue that needs to be um, addressed because uh, where we've seen OERs work extremely well is when there are sort of challenge funds so that people can go to their, their dean or their head of department and say, you know, I've got this idea for this new program, new resource, can I get some funding for it? That can work extremely well. Um, and the last one is about teachers' contracts, and I think this is a, a big piece that maybe we need to move on to the, um, the, 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 the discussion on the online, um, Robert and Max, but, um, you know, the concept of teaching changes when you use these resource-based um, and, and OER type approaches, because the definition of teaching, teachers' contracts generally are that you are contracted to work 16, 20, whatever it is, hours, face-to-face -face contact time in a classroom. Whereas this approach challenges that because when you are developing these resources, we consider that to be teaching. Now that gives problems to teachers who say, well, if I'm not in a classroom, then I'm going to be accused of underutilization. So there's a big piece there that, that maybe we can explore elsewhere. And I think uh, everyone, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you, Alison. Um... There were some questions uh, uh, during your presentation uh, in the, uh, posted in the in the chat, so I can go through them and uh, maybe uh, uh, ask them to you. Well, the first is uh, that maybe a very uh, um, very obvious, but you didn't mention it. Um, the learning materials in Invest Africa they are all developed as OER. Yes, everything that I uh, mentioned is an OER, and if I can add something to this little box, yes, I can. If people would like to go to that website, oh, okay. oh, that's yeah. where people, you can search for um, any of our OER materials. We have another one. I will just check as well if I can find the... Uh, the web link for that one as well but yeah everything is available everything is under a um, nearly all of our materials are under a CC by SA license for those of you who have done their homework after Cable's presentation <laughs> um, 
A few of our, our materials are under a CC BY license because they were funded through the Hewlett Foundation and that's okay. their requirement. But generally, yeah. we ask that people um, attribute where they've got the materials from um, and also share alike. So the whole thing that's going to make this work is when people take our resources or anybody's resources, adapt them to their own context, and then share them so that other people can, can benefit, because hopefully they've improved them. Yes, okay. Um, a second question, um, you mentioned that uh, in, Invest, uh, in the Invest Africa program that uh, sharing across uh, countries uh, is not uh, happening. Uh, what are possible reasons for that? Well, uh, one thing I think is partly what I mentioned, the, the not invented here syndrome. I think that that's one, one thing. But more than that, I think, I think I see it almost as a failure on my part in my role within that, that partnership. I think perhaps I needed to have done more to provide mechanisms for sharing. And I think this is something that Cole and UNESCO and other interested agencies need to look at because um, teachers are busy, you know, they, they have full, full teaching loads. If they're working in OER and developing these resources, they're, they're, a lot of them are doing this in their own time. But then what mechanisms do we have to make it easy for them to share? Now, yes, we have, um, we have Oasis, the, the, the link that I just shared, and I'm about to share another one. Um, but I think that you know, we've got this online community, the Community Learning Network, which many people are members of. Um, and it was always my intention that that would also be um, a mechanism for sharing materials. And it ha just hasn't really happened. All of the materials I've mentioned are available from, from both um, Oasis, but also the, the online learning community, Community Learning Network. Um, but I think it's that. I think it's mechanisms. And, and, uh, and the support structure, is that part of this mechanism you mentioned? Uh, because uh, I guess sharing materials is something a teacher can do, but maybe also uh, someone working in a library or so. Absolutely. I think we're seeing that um, librarians are becoming increasingly important in um, the whole OER um, approach. Now, that we've not paid a lot of attention to those in um, in the recent years, simply because the majority of the TVED institutions that, that are our partners do not have librarians. Okay. okay? Um, you know, it's the bigger institutions, the polytechnics maybe, and, and the institutes, um, universities of science and technology, they, they do. But the smaller institutes, they don't. It all falls to the teachers. Okay. Um... There is another question. Uh, uh, you mentioned a, a, a platform from, from Call for sharing and uh, between countries and organizations. But is such an international platform a necessary condition, or could it also be done some other way? Well, I mean, there are plenty of repositories. Um, Cable mentions some of them. I have another OER presentation that I share with partners and I go through them. And there are literally, you know, tens, if not hundreds of places where you can find resources. I mean, everyone recognizes that this is an issue. Um, but I'm talking about sharing between people who know each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I think maybe we can come back to this question after Pauline's done her presentation because what's happening in the Caribbean where they have a regional qualification that is shared between countries, that's even more interesting and, and, and you know, gives a lot more potential. Okay, then we, 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 we post this question until after the, the uh, presentation of Pauline. Um, well, thank you for this uh, for so far and then uh, I'll, uh, I'll want to introduce uh, Pauline. And I guess uh, Max has now to do some uh, technical stuff. Uh, but I uh, start in the meantime by introducing Pauline. Pauline Whiteman, she's a senior manager and uh, program development and management department from the National Training Agency in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and prior to this, uh, she uh, taught at various uh, TVET uh, subjects at uh, secondary and tertiary level. And she did that for 24 years. Uh, she has educated at the University of the West Indies and the John Donaldson Technical Institute. 
and uh, did also uh, several courses in several uh, other uh, universities and training centers. And she is, uh, the subject is the Caribbean vocational qualification, where she is uh, currently um, yeah, part of. Uh, and um, she will tell you about the subject of this uh, vocational qualification and the uh, role of OERs in it. I see the presentation. I don't see Pauline yet. Uh, so, but Pauline, the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction. Yes, hi. So, are you here? Okay, good morning and thank you for that introduction. Uh, as you can see from the first slide, um, this project was done in collaboration with the Commonwealth of Learning and Dr. Richardson being the lead from CAL. Now, The Caribbean vocational qualification is based on a common regional approach to training, assessment, and certification, as agreed by the Caribbean Association of National Training Agencies. And it employs the CBET, the competency-based education and training model. The CBQ is one of the requirements for obtaining the CARICOM skills certificate, which allows a CARICOM national to seek work in another member state as a wage earner. Now, approved national training agencies across the region have been engaging in engaging TVET centers in assessor training and certification activities. However, NTA is not yet approved to award CBQs. They need to seek consultancies from the approved NTAs. Now, uh, Pauline, in the Caribbean, sorry, sorry that, that yes. I interrupt, but uh, we see, still see the uh, the first slide, and I guess you browse uh, in, in. Right, the I would, I would, um, I would change the slide. I would, I would, I'm changing the slides. You, you, I will change the slide. Yeah, you, you, yes. the owner of the presentation. Okay. So then when you, when you browse, then we all can see the browsing. Okay. All right. Or you have to take over. I don't know what the... So, can you okay. see a button called Takeover as Presenter? Um, well, there is... Presenter. I don't know top. how to do that. Uh, uh, so, so maybe, Max, you can uh, you can help here. Oh. Pauline oh, okay. should have okay. a button at the top oh. that says Takeover okay. as Presenter. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now now it's fine. Sorry. I So do I do I okay. So do I continue or start over? Continue. Continue. Good, great. Okay. So um now as prescribed by the Caribbean Association of National Training Agencies. Assessors must be trained and certified to assess for the CBQ. However, we have been experiencing many challenges with respect to getting instructors trained up as assessors throughout the region. Now, firstly, face-to-face -face training, as we all know, is very costly. It requires payments for training, venue, tuition, travel, etc. And I mentioned before that some national training agencies are not yet approved to award CBQs. And therefore, they are required to seek consultancies from approved NTAs. And of course, that is also um, costly. And what we realize, what we have realized, especially since we embarked on this initiative, there is variation in methodology and content of assessor training programs delivered by even the approved NTAs across the region. Now, in, in 2014 and 2015, visits were made by call to understand the TVET context and the challenges faced. And subsequent to that, 10 countries attended a workshop in Barbados. 
to discuss engaging in a more flexible approach or I would say to TVET that would help countries to respond to, to changing training needs. One of the outcomes of that workshop was the initiation of a working relationship between the Commonwealth of Learning and CANTA to support the development of an online CBQ assessor training program. And the aim of this program was to harness the potential of open education resources for CBQ assessor training. So the Commonwealth of Learning and members of CANTA uh, namely Barbados, Grenada, and Trinidad and Tobago got together to develop online resources to support the training and, and certification of assessors throughout the Caribbean. And of course, these we know what the learning resources you heard about what these OERs are. And um, the intention was to have the materials freely available use by any institution in the Caribbean. Now the development, the online program development required the adaptation of existing CBQ assessor training materials to online materials. The teams worked through workshops in Barbados and via online meetings. We used Skype and um, the technology used facilitated regular communication between the Caribbean countries involved and advisors in Canada. Now the OER designed, we ensured that we adhere to important factors regarding the quality of OERs, such as the use of appropriate metadata alignment uh, competency standards and assessments. We ensure that the content is free from bias and we included both formative and summative assessments. Now, we would have experienced many challenges with respect to developing the, the content as well as rolling out the pilot after we had completed the development. And um, some of these challenges included, well, first of all time, um, we realized that for both rollout of the program as well as development of content, we needed adequate time. Sometimes we, we more or less um, set unrealistic time frames for for ourselves and um, and we had to revisit the time we allocated to certain completing certain um, tasks. We had issues regarding the harmonization of materials because as I said um, from the previous screen uh, we realized that there were variations in the content of assessor training material delivered by the different countries. Um, we had to get accustomed to our roles as developers as well. That also took some time. And of course, the issue of funding. Now, we were very fortunate to have the call, the Commonwealth of Learning involved, directly involved and they were in constant contact with us, provided a lot of support, but I, um, in terms of moving forward, so any, any country looking to embark on such a, a program, of course, funding could be an issue. With respect to the rollout of the pilot, because a pilot has been completed, um, what we would have experienced um, if there's a low level of motivation from the participants that would be challenging. Um, long response lag time from facilitators would also pose challenges. Unavailability of trained facilitators, you know, in one, in like a couple instances, we had 
in two of the countries, we had identified, let's say, about four facilitators, two per country, and we ended up having just one person um, facilitating. And then, of course, the technical issues and uh, the lack of a social presence presented some issues to some of the participants in the pilot program. Now, going back to the, to the target group for the assessor training, the original intention was to develop this uh, program for CBQ assessors. However, we realized that the content would have been also applicable for TVET instructors who conduct competency-based assessments, uh, teachers in secondary schools of, of CXC, the Caribbean Examination Council exams, both at the fifth form and sixth and seventh uh, form level, and also those persons, those teachers working towards uh, 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 claiming for awards of candidates for both the CBQ as well as the CXC, CSEC, or CAPE qualifications. Now, again, um, in terms of the program, there was a need to build capacity, build the capacity of assessor trainers. And um, the project offered an opportunity for assessor trainers to build capacity in delivering these online um, modules, the, on, the training online. Call developed an online course called Facilitating Online Courses, and this was made available to assessor trainers from Barbados, Grenada, and Trinidad and Tobago. And the focus was on enabling assessor trainers to use the various technologies available to deliver in an online environment. Uh, throughout the Carib throughout between Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, Grenada, 19 CVQ assessor trainers successfully completed the training. Okay, so moving on, um, with respect to sustainability and affordability, we must ensure the success of the program. And we need to consider how to sustain the pilots at, of, at full scale. So the development team would have had initial discussions on pricing strategies and policies for students. And um, this would have been presented to Cantor for approval. Uh, the documentation for the regional program um, would be sh will be shared with Cantor members. It would have been shared, we, we understand. There was a Cantor meeting just last week. But the plan is to offer a region-wide program in Jan starting January of 2018. Call will make the materials for the course available as OER. And to obtain certification, course participants must register with one of the approved entities and pay the required certification fee. Certification fee. The pilot cohort was hosted on a call Moodle platform and subsequently call will help to build capacity in Moodle hosting once a decision is taken regarding which countries will be utilizing the online training. As a matter of fact, call is at this time organizing Moodle administration training for Three, the three countries that were originally involved. Um, countries will also be able to host their own platform if they prefer. With respect to the benefits of the program, I had alluded to the potential of this online program to standardize and increase access to assessor training and certification. And um, we have seen where the the actual quality of the content that was developed, um, the, the, the quality would have increased. And um, also, 
we're talking about the the increased access to assessor training and certification we have a lot of 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 persons already interested in in pursuing this program online uh, it can also reduce we see it as reducing the costs associated with the implementation of the cvq i had mentioned uh, what contributed to those high costs it provides a level of flexibility because people can study at their own convenience it also allows for consistency in assessor training throughout the region and it facilitates progress in the in the implementation of the CVQ. It also allows countries with the capacity to do face-to-face -face training to set higher targets for certification of assessors and verifiers. It provides easy access to information both before and after assessors have been certified and it is accessible and relevant to all training institutions that utilize the competency-based approach to assessment. Now, in, in conclusion, and um, I will just mention um, some of the, the lessons learned as well. Now, the original intent of the having the CBQ online assessor training program is to increase access and um, to lead in towards the achievement of the goal as stated in the CARICOM regional CBET strategy, the continuous professional development of instructors. And um, this strategy focuses on the creation of a globally competent competitive region through a demand-led education and training system. And we saw this as one of the viable means to this end. So in terms of capacity building, we see this program as a very, very important enabler in the region. Um, we need to ensure, however, we need to ensure that persons acquire the requisite ICT skills to allow this to happen. Uh, we need to get a larger number of facilitators involved in delivering in an online setting as well. But basically what we have found is that um, just the emphasize access, increasing this program, increasing access, this program leading to uh, a higher quality in terms of content that would have been delivered and leading to harmonization throughout the region. So that's about it. Um, for now, uh, I'll, I suppose I'll take any any questions. Yeah. Thank you, Pauline. Um, this is an um, interesting story. There are indeed some questions posed in the um, in the chat window, so I will go through that. There's one question uh, in your on your sheet about OER design. Uh, you mentioned uh, ensuring that the content is free from bias. What do you mean by free from bias? Free from any any kind of bias because when when we were developing the the content, we had to ensure, like for instance, um, equality of opportunity um, in terms of of um, that was that was. I mean, it was new to us in terms of looking specifically at the content to make sure that it doesn't present any kind of of bias whatsoever so gender in bias. terms of the language lang gender bias language structure oh, okay. um anything like that okay 
and and you also mentioned that that uh, that you are uh, um, trans yeah actually starting from existing materials and uh, develop them uh, to OER. I guess you yes. uh, you came into copyright uh, uh, problems then. Is is that right? And how did you uh, manage them? The the original material used would have been developed by Kanta. And as you, as um, we indicated, this was a counter call project. So, all so uh, the, the 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 content that we would have taken from the internet, like things, for example, um, YouTube videos and so on, mm -hmm. we ensure that we would not violate any any um, okay. any okay. copyright. Yeah. Um. And uh, other question, uh, yeah, this, uh, you, you mentioned uh, several benefits which, uh, which were the result of this, uh, this, this pilot and this approach. What do you consider the largest benefit? The largest benefit would be increasing access. Increasing access. Increasing okay. access, yes. Yeah. Um, Robert, can I say something about that? Yes. Just that... The idea, you see, is that now these materials have been done, they've been quality assured, and so the, and, and will be published as open education resource. It means that any country that has its own NTA and therefore can offer this program and accredit assessors can take this material and, and include it in their program offerings. So they can do face-to-face -face training or they can do online training, more flexible training, if that's what they want to do. It also means that countries, um, as Pauline mentioned, that do not have their own NTA yet, can have access to training that's more affordable. Because historically, one of those three countries that, that developed this program, had to, somebody from there had to go to, say, St. Kitts or to um, St. Vincent and carry out the assessor training. That doesn't have to happen anymore. Okay, I've lost you. Yeah. Question again, um, with respect to the, I'm seeing a question here, uh, the CARICOM strategy focuses on no sound? Demand led training and education. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I said something, but I forgot to, to, uh, to put my sound on. That's, uh, <laughs> that was, uh, that where the, where, where this comes from. Um, but you also already came to the question, CARICOM strategy focuses on demand-led training and education. How do OER contribute to this? Okay, in terms of, of um, the, the, the demand-led system, mm -hmm. um, now, with respect to this particular project that we, we, um, we speak into, the, all of the instructors within CARICOM must be trained up as assessors. You have quite a number, a large number of Tibet instructors, but they are not trained to assess to the CBQ, which follows the, the demand-led system. Uh, the standards are developed, and if there are any new standards that are developed, then we need to train new assessors in those occupational areas, for those occupational areas. So this is why I was saying the, the major, um, the aim was to try to increase access throughout the region to facilitate the rolling out of this CARICOM strategy. Okay. Now there are other areas where OER can contribute, like, um, and Alison alluded to some of this, yes, it is in areas, but there are other areas um, that where OER would play a major role. Um, for example, some of the projects Alison spoke about earlier, where some of the content for some actual occupational skills areas and its skill areas are being converted to uh, distance learning mode. Okay, thank you. Um,
I guess yeah, there is one one question uh, also from from Max, but I think this has already been answered in the chat by uh, by Alison, and it was. Uh, the impression from Max that uh, that the majority of people involved were women. He said it's not maybe not directly related to the topic, but he's still curious. But uh, uh, Alison mentioned that the, the majority was in, indeed uh, 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 women in the CVQ. The in terms of the development, okay. So I just want some clarification. Um, with respect to a question, um, you're referring to, okay, so let me see here. Okay, for the pilot, yes, the majority would have been women, yes. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. then there is another question. Uh, having an OER for CVQs is great, especially in the Caribbean region. Uh, how will it affect the business process of institutions that benefit from consultancy? <laughs> Shall I answer that? Oh, oh sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you can only offer CVQ assessor training if you are uh, accredited by Cantor to do so. So this is not a qualification which is openly available just to anybody who wants to offer it, is, is the first thing. Um, the second thing is that our concern in producing this um, program as OER was was really just to make to increase access. Um, you know, our, our concern was the fact that yes, it, it's possible for say the smaller countries without an NTA to pay somebody to come and do that training. But if they couldn't afford to do to do that, it meant that you know, in, in a face to face way, then it meant that that the training wasn't happening. So that's why we developed the OER. Yes. Um, clear to me. I, I hope uh, the, the person who uh, answered, who, who uh, taught the question, was uh, Eldridge Medija. Uh, I hope I pronounced it uh, well. Uh, is uh, yeah, uh, is, is satisfied with, with your answer. Um, and then there is a, a question from John uh, who asks about the trained assessors developing their own OER and adding it up into a repository. Is that happening? And okay. is there a plan for that? And are they required to make OERs themselves? Okay, can I answer that? Yes. Yes. Um, what is happening? I can speak for Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, there is a, a database that we established that has that functionality but is not being used as yet by the assessors. But the intention is to have uh, the assessors develop, um, develop, I suppose, material that can be used and can be shared. But as I said, that that is not is not being is not operationalized as yet, right. and I'm 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 not too sure uh, what will happen in the other countries. Okay, uh, are there are there any plans to 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 uh, have those assessors uh, uh, develop their, their their OERs and sharing it? Uh, to, to, uh, uh, is there a plan for the future for this? I can see that happening in the future. Okay. It has been happening. It has been happening. Um, I, if I can speak to, to this with CXC, um, they do have a, a portal where materials are developed and uploaded for use. But um, and CXC also awards CBQ level one. But so in that as, in that case, it's being done. But in mm -hmm. terms of the other levels and the other the other awarding bodies it's not yet being done but i believe that we can do so in the future okay and, and also robert you know cole continues to work with various partners throughout the caribbean 
So right now we're developing um, the CVQ Level 1 Life Skills Program as OER with um, a, a, a company in, in Trinidad. And once those are done, those will also be available through Cole website and through the, their, their own institution's website. And other people will be able to take those materials and adapt them and use them. Because, as I said, with the regional qualification, um, there is enormous scope for sharing. Yeah, yeah, but adapting and then uh, use them, that is that's the easy part. But then uh, persuade them to share them, those adapted, that's the difficult part. Uh, yeah, this afternoon I had a conversation for an, a completely other project and we had the same issue. Yes. And that, 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 that's a challenge. There is uh, also one question left uh, uh, from Max uh, uh, and that was uh, addressed to you, Alison, about uh, uh, Uses of uh, Creative Commons uh, uh, share alike uh, license uh, instead of the Creative Commons uh, attribution license. Uh, I will uh, go back to this question. Uh, no, I see it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I. It's pretty simple, really, Max. Um, the reason that Cole puts a CC BY SA share alike license on is because we want to to actually require people to share. So if coal puts its resources, which come from Ministry of Education budgets, into a particular country and a particular institution to develop an OER, we, we think it's only right that they should also be required to share that material, not just attribute it. Uh, actually, the share alike uh, 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 clause in, in, in a license is that when you share, you should use the same license. But if you not share, then uh, then it has no, no no. Then they are not. Uh, uh, it is not that you are uh, uh, mandatory to share it. That's well, that that's not our interpretation, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I guess it is. But otherwise, it would be easy. Everyone using a CC by SA is uh, is mandatory to share. But that is not what is happening. Uh, and I don't know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that is not the meaning of the uh, uh, interpretation of the share alike. But it is, um, Max also uh, uh, mentioned the, the, the challenge of, of remixing. Uh, when, you, um, when you are remixing uh, uh, with different licenses, that could cause a problem. And yeah. they can run into those problems. We, we have come up against that. Um, and sometimes, you know, we actually put... Uh, you know, if you take some material from, let's say, from something that, that's only got a CC BY license on it, um, we might actually put the license for that particular resource if it's within the material. So it might be a video or a graphic or something. And we might actually put the specific license for that resource underneath it in, in, yeah. in our material. But yeah, I agree, it gets complex. Yeah. Then there is a question for Pauline. I don't know if she, I see her typing, but I still ask a question. Did you compensate instructors for whose existing materials you adapt? Oh, yes. I just had the answer. Um, I indicated that we had used, developed uh, materials that would have been developed and owned by Cantor. So that there was no need to compensate. Um, okay. They were already paid for really? those materials. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Um, well, I guess we are, we have all the questions answered. Uh, well, thank you, Pauline and uh, Alison, for your, uh, both for your presentations, your openness and uh, your willingness to share your, your experience. It is very, very interesting. I guess we can share uh, your, your uh, PowerPoints, which you sent to us uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the forum. Uh, I don't know if you want to put a Creative Commons license on those. <laughs> What's Public that? domain. What's that, Max? Uh, oh, we would like to share your 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 presentation slides, which you uh, sent to us uh, uh, through the forum. But I was asking, uh, I was just joking. Uh, do you want to put a Creative Commons license on those uh, presentations? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> just, just kidding. So thank you very much for your for your presentations. And uh, well, uh, this uh, this was recorded, and we will post it as soon as possible. The the the, um, the video on the on the platform. Uh, well, uh, I think we've learned a lot, and I think it is uh, very uh, it was very useful. Thank you again. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.